morning, Springs Church. Welcome. Let's stand together and begin to praise our Lord. Give us just a second. Oh, try now, Davis. Wait. There it is. All right, here we go. Worship God together in song. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Are good and your mercy endureth forever. People from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation. Good in your mercy, endure it forever. For people from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation.
Praise God. Let's have a seat together. Good morning. Oh, that'll wake you up. Now, it's good to see that we have not as big a... We, ha, we don't have a big hole over here. This, we had a big hole over there. A lot of our youth uh, went, went to Winterfest, but it's good to see that they're back. And they'll be having a, gar a, uh, a car wash to pay for those damages next, <laughs> next week. Anyway, i just kidding. Anyway, uh, do we have a slide for the uh, visitors? Yeah, okay. You, uh, you can sign up the newfangled way with this uh, QR code on your uh, Sunday sheet. You need to have an app for that, but you can also do it the old-fashioned way back over here on the reception desk. We have some cards that you can fill out. And we actually have a couple of uh, couples that, who have joined us, but I can't tell you who they are because they said, wait, wait, so we'll find about uh, probably next week. Also next week, you need to remember that this kicks off our missions month. We do a one-shot contribution on the end of February, and the worship services have a theme of missions to get ready for that, so keep that in mind. Lots of different good things going on in the um, Sunday sheet, but there's one thing that's incorrect, and that says that Jim Stafford going to have surgery Friday. Well, he was. He was going to have it Wednesday, and then it was going to be Friday. It's scheduled now, at least the latest that I heard, for 12 today. So we pray that that goes well. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteousness, righteous requirements of the law might be fully met. Um, the Henleys have... Uh, started re-engage which is a class for reigniting marriages and relationships and Monima and I are blessed to be part of that class this uh, this winter and in you're in that class you get to hear people's stories and often when you hear people's stories if they're being honest you hear some stories about brokenness but you also hear stories of redemption and forgiveness This past Wednesday, Monima and I heard a couple, a wonderful couple, tell their story about brokenness. But that's okay, because that room was full of broken people. Well, and that's okay, because this room, too, is full of broken people. But that's okay. Because this room is also full of forgiven people. It's full of healed and healing people. This room is full of people who have been made whole again and are being made whole through Christ. Remember the words of John. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your son. And in his name we pray. And we thank you for healing. We thank you for forgiveness. We thank you for being made whole through his blood. Amen. Let's stand and continue to praise God and worship this morning.
the strong and perfect plea the great high priest whose name is love whoever lives and pleads for me my name is graven on his hands my name is written on his heart of the guilt within upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin because the sinless Savior died my sinful soul Christ has risen and he is interceding on behalf of us. Let's praise him this morning as the risen one. Behold him there, the risen lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the king of glory and of grace. One with himself I cannot die. take this moment to confess the gap between who we have been and who we have become in Christ. Let's confess our sins to God and one another. Lord our God, in our sin we have avoided your call. Our love for you is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes away early. Have mercy on us, deliver us from judgment, bind up our wounds and revive us. Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
I grew up a missionary kid, preacher's kid, go every time the church, church doors are open kid. I attended church camp, youth rallies, monthly roller skating nights, and I could recite the, recite the Bible books in order forward and literally backwards. The faith that I put together in those years was mostly a perpetual feeling of never praying, studying, or working hard enough for God and arguing with Baptists. <laughs> We would sing about the joy, 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 but what was mostly down in my heart was guilt. When I was older, a friend from a different church asked me, how's your relationship with Jesus? I was dumbfounded. What did that even mean? As an adult, I came across a book that brought to light how God delights in me, no matter how hard I work. This was my first realization of the miracle of God's grace. I was amazed at the new way I heard 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. I began to see God's hand everywhere. I was all in with assurance and trusting God. Even in disappointment, I believed God had a plan that I just couldn't see. But then in recent years, painful tragedy struck our family even though we prayed and pleaded with God to intervene. And through our experience in being foster parents, we've learned of the unspeakable horror that can happen to precious children. I couldn't reconcile the fact that a God who could do anything let those things happen. Doubt that had been bubbling up was getting harder to push down. I began to wonder, is God good all the time, like we say? How does God's compassion reconcile with eternal punishment? How is the Old Testament God the same as the New Testament God? It kept peeling back. Do I believe? If I'm not a believer, who am I? These questions terrified me. I felt like the floor was pulled out from under me, and I was falling down an endless hole. I began to have panic attacks at church, and they got worse. But after a season of searching for answers, I came to realize that no matter what, I loved Jesus, and I could not let him go. He gathered up precious children like my own. He surrounded himself with flawed and broken people. He gave me hope. In fact, I found myself in a relationship with Jesus. He put the floor back under me, and as I continued to pray for Father God to show me who he is, I'm mindful that in John 14, 9, Jesus said, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. I'm still searching, but this is what I know. Jesus loves me. He loves the person who makes me very uncomfortable. Jesus loves you right now, exactly as you are, sitting in your chair with your fears and secrets and habits. I accept you and give you grace because Jesus has given me more than I can keep. Will you pray with me? Holy God, I believe. Please help me overcome my unbelief. Now, God, as we share the cup and the bread, help us to remember our precious Jesus as he commanded. Help us to take his body and his blood, which was poured out for us in your perfect plan. I love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. We have baskets at the tables if you'd like to bring your offering for the continued ministry of this church body. Come to the tables. Sure. 
to give us direction lead us by good clear paths show us the way our tired and restless ways Let's stand and continue to praise God together. Hide me the way, O oh Lord. Hide me away, O oh Lord. Hide me away, O oh Lord. Hide me away, O oh Lord. In the day of trouble, neath the shadow of your wings. Hide me away, O oh Lord. Hide me away, O oh Lord. Give me your peace, O oh Lord. Give me your peace. So Lord, give me your peace, O oh In the day of trouble, neath the shadow of your wings, give me your peace, O oh Lord. Give me your peace, O oh Lord. Safe in your dwelling. 
dwelling place. I'm safe in your dwelling place. Safe in your dwelling place. Safe in your dwelling in the day of trouble, neath the shadow of your wings. Safe in your dwelling place. Safe in your dwelling place. So hide me away.
down to sin or to shame. We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, our conqueror. Nothing is impossible. Every chain is breakable with you. We are victorious. You are stronger than our hearts. You are greater than the dark with you. We are victorious. We are more than conquerors through Christ. You have overcome this world, this life. We will not bow to sin or to shame. We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, our conqueror. Our Lord, our God, our conqueror. Amen. Have a seat, church. I will be reading Acts chapter 6. But as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve called a meeting of the, all the believers. They said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. And so brothers select seven. the brothers selected seven men who were all respected and full of the spirit and wisdom they gave them this responsibility then the apostles can spend their time in the prayer and teaching of the word everyone liked this idea and they chose the following stephan a man full of faith in the holy spirit philip prochorus nicanor timon parmenas and nicholas of antioch an earlier convert from the to the jewish faith these seven were presented to the apostles apostles who prayed for them as their as they lay their hands on them. So God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. Stephan, a man of God's grace and power, performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. But one day, some men from the synagogue of freed slaves, as it was called, started to debate with him. They were Jews from Cyrene, Alexandria, Sicilia, and the province of Asia. None of them could stand against the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen spoke. So they persuaded some men to lie about Stephen, saying, We heard him blaspheme Moses and even God. This roused the people, the elders, and the teachers of religious law. So they arrested Stephen and brought him before the council. The lying witnesses said, This man is always speaking against the holy temple and against the law of Moses. We have heard him say, that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy the temple and change the customs Moses handed down to us. At this point, everyone in the high council stared at Stephen because of his, because his face become as bright as the angels. Can you hear me now? All right. Well, good morning, church. I am really excited about this season and what God's Spirit is doing among us. You're going to hear more about some things that are coming up uh, in the next few weeks about ways you can involve. But let me share a few things. Uh, a couple have already been said. In February is our missions month, which Monty talked about earlier in the leader moment. The missions month is for us to focus our time and attention and even our resources to talking about the missionaries we support around the world. And also, uh, it's leading up to the final Sunday in the month of February, where we'll, we will be giving our offerings and making our pledges and throughout, that will last throughout the whole year. And this is to support the work of the missionaries that we support around the world. So we don't do these offerings often, but next month is our chance. And the missions committee has also, uh, they're going to present a vision about a new work that we're considering. And so you're going to hear more about in the next month, 
through our worship and our preaching, and you're going to hear about the missionaries, and we want you to begin praying and thinking about the ways you can continue to participate in God's mission around the world. Another thing that's really exciting, I had the privilege of going to Winterfest last Sunday. Aren't we glad the youth is back? Parents, don't clap too loud. The parents are like, oh, it was a great break. Thank God. Man, it was a time of worship. It was a time of laughter. It was a time of late nights. It was a time of sharing. It was a time of spiritual growth. And yes, it was a time to make a stop at Bucky's in Fort Worth. And apparently during our time, this happened. Who is that? What do you mean that's not very good? The internet is forever, yes. And whoever uh, took that video was very sneaky to do it from behind. I, I don't know who that was, but the Holy Spirit must have got inside him. And but during, we had a great, great time at Winterfest. And one of the things that we were challenged at Winterfest uh, one of the main speakers actually was, uh, he was an author and wrote screenplays for movies. And he's an author of comic books. He's the author of DC, of several stories in DC and Marvel, and he pitches movie stories, or, or kind of uh, movie pitches and writes screenplays for stories. And one of the things that he talked about is that everyone has a story to tell. Whether you know it or not, everyone has a story. So one night after we went through, actually it was Friday night, we talked about uh, at Winterfest, everybody has a story. I was in the room uh, uh, that I was chaperoning, and uh, Carson Henley was in my room. And I was going around and asking different questions about uh, what they learned that night. And I looked at Carson and I said, Carson, do you have a story? And Carson went, well, I know the right answer is yes, I do have a story. But to tell you the truth, I don't want to tell you that because then I'm afraid you're going to make me tell it. <laughs> and I have no clue what it is. <laughs> I said, no, Carson, you don't have to tell that story. And I don't blame Carson. But in our text this morning, the beginning of this text that was read, this is a story about Stephen. And Stephen has a story to tell. But this is not just Stephen's personal story. This is Stephen's communal story. This is, this is a personal story to Stephen, but it's not just his story. This is God's story. This is Israel's story. And this story defines, in many ways, who Stephen is. As we read in the text, it says that Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit, and he was given wisdom by the Holy Spirit. But accusations came against Stephen. And some from the Sanhedrin, or some of the teachers of the law, began to, to say, he is blasphemy. He's talking against Moses. And evidently, he's been talking against the the temple as well. He's been saying some things. And then it says, but they could not stand up against the wisdom that the Spirit gave Stephen as he spoke. And what's interesting about what happens after this, even though they make accusations against Stephen, 
what's really, really weird about this story is that Stephen doesn't even try to give a defense of himself. Isn't that interesting? Like the first thing I want to do when someone accuses me of something is go, whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. Let me explain myself. Stephen doesn't do that. He doesn't attempt to explain himself. Is there any way I can get rid of the crackling? Pull it away. All right, let me. All right, can you hear me? I don't know if you can hear me now. Hello, hello, test. Is that better? Go, go set it. Because when I can hear the popping, that's bad. Stephen doesn't try to make a defense of himself. It's really strange. In fact, what he does is he goes through and he tells almost the entire story. It's interesting. Uh, I was talking with... Um, had lunch with Kelsey Herndon and Charles Ricks and Don McLaughlin, who's a fantastic preacher of the Word of God, and he preached and he, and he uh, spoke in chapel at Oakland Christian. We went out to lunch, and we were talking about this, and really, we were talking about how they probably didn't order our Bibles correctly, because really, the Old Testament should really end. It should end with the Gospels and with Acts. And then... The New Testament should be Paul's letters, which is just commentary on the whole thing. Because really, you understand all of Jesus' story from this story that we find in the Old Testament. And this is the longest sermon, or this is the longest uh, extended dialogue that we have in the book of Acts. And so Stephen doesn't try to defend himself at all which is very odd. Instead, he just tells the story. And it goes something like this. He said, God called Abraham, and he says, leave your home and go to the place I will show you. And when he didn't have any children, and when he didn't have any land, he says, You're gonna, your descendants are going to be great. And then they're going to go to Egypt, but then God's going to deliver them out of Egypt, and they're going to go, and they're going to inherit the land. So he gives him the, the, the covenant of circumcision, and then Isaac is born. And he circumcised Isaac, and then Isaac gives birth to Jacob. And then Jacob gives birth to the 12 patriarchs, one of which is named Joseph. And all the other patriarchs get jealous of Joseph because of all of his wisdom. So what do they do? They betray him, and they sell him to the Egyptians, and he's taken off to Egypt. But it says God is with Joseph. And he's given wisdom and insight. And he rises above the ranks that the, the Pharaoh of Egypt recognizes this. And he rises up. And then he predicts this famine that's coming to the land. In fact, it does. And so eventually his brothers, the ones that sold him into slavery, come to Egypt. And they're saved from the famine. And they're reconciled to their brother. But then as time moves on and Israel grows in number in Egypt, a new Pharaoh comes to power. And this Pharaoh doesn't remember who Joseph is. He doesn't know who Joseph is. So what he does is he enslaves all the people. He takes all the Israelites that are numerous now who have actually, through Joseph, been a blessing to Egypt, and he enslaves them. And he's so treacherous against all, all the Israelites that at one point he begins killing all the firstborn, throwing them out. But then there's this one called Moses. And Moses is protected by his mother and put in a basket, floated down the river. And it just so happens that Pharaoh's daughter finds Moses picks him up, cares for him like he is one of her own. So he's educated in Egypt. He grows in wisdom and knowledge. In fact, Stephen says, 
he is powerful in speech and in action. One day, Moses is walking through, around, and looking around at the kingdom, and he notices an Egyptian that's mistreating one of the Israelite slaves. And he thinks, this is not right, so he goes and addresses this thing, and there's a confrontation, and ends up killing the Egyptian. Hides the body away. The next day, he sees two Israelites arguing with one another, and he goes over to them. He says, what are you guys doing? Your brothers, why are you arguing? And they turn around and they say, who are you to judge us? <laughs> are you going to kill us like you killed that Egyptian yesterday? And Moses' eyes get really, really big. He knows. They know. So Moses books it out of town, heads to Midian for 40 years. He's there. Until one day, he's out as a shepherd, and he comes across this bush, but this is no ordinary bush. This bush is on fire, but it's not burning up. And Moses is trembling, and it says that the angel of the Lord is speaking on behalf of God through the burning bush, and he says, I am the Lord your God, Moses. I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and where you are standing right now, this is holy ground. Take off your sandals. So Moses unstraps his sandals, and he says, Moses, I'm going to send you to Egypt because I have seen I've seen the misery of my people, and I've come down, and I have heard their groaning. And so, Moses, I'm sending you back to Egypt. So Moses goes back to Egypt. And through signs and wonders, he delivers God's people through the sea. And then he walks them out into the wilderness. And he tells the people... God's going to raise up prophets for you. And he goes up to the mountain and he gets the commands. But when he brings the commands back down, God's people refuse to obey. So God gives them over to all kinds of idol worship until finally one day, way down the road, God actually sends them off into exile. But before that, he actually has Moses build them a tabernacle because so they can walk with the Israelites walk with his people. But then Stephen goes on to say, but God, he doesn't live in temples made by human hands or in tabernacles. He is the God that is seated and thrown in heaven and the earth is his footstool. This, Stephen says, is our story. This is all of your stories. And this is a story like Stephen we should share with everybody. This like Stephen we should give witness to all the great things that God has done. Because God is the primary actor in this story. And Stephen is giving witness to all that God has done. This is your story. And like Stephen we should share it. But here's the ironic part about this whole thing. When Stephen tells this story in chapter 7 of Acts, we didn't even read it. I just kind of narrated through it just now. When Stephen tells this big, long story, this story is actually not for the world. This story in the book of Acts is not for people that don't know God. This story he tells is for God's people. Who he's telling it to, these are God's people. He's telling it to Israelites. And here's what's really ironic about it, because here's what this story is doing. He says, when God fulfills his promise to Abraham and gives him a son, Isaac, who has Jacob, who then is the father of the twelve. 
It says Joseph is one of the twelve. And in chapter 7, verse 9, it says this. And because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave in Egypt. Then when Moses came to save the Israelites from the Egyptians, from that, remember that one story where he sees the Egyptian and he's beating this Israelite and he comes and he has a confrontation and he kills this Egyptian and saves this one slave. Verse 25 says this, then Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. And then once Moses leads his people out of Egypt, it says in verse 7, this same Moses who told the Israelites that God would raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. He was in the assembly of the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our ancestors. And he received the living word from God and passed it on to us. But the verse 39, it says, but our ancestors refused to obey him. Instead, they rejected him and in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt. And then finally, we get in the story. Stephen gets to the end of the story. This story that everyone that he's talking to, that all of God's people, the Israelites are standing from, everyone knows this story. At the end of this story, he says to them, you are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Test. All right, let's do this. This is not a story that Moses is telling for the world. I need you to hear this. This is a story that Luke intends the book of Acts for the church to hear. You're just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. And what he's saying is, is that those that don't remember their history are bound to repeat it. This is the temptation for the church in every generation. And we probably know that. I, I know this congregation. I know you'd be freely admit, yep. I'm guilty. And I'm not saying that because you are. I'm saying that because I am. And I'm saying that because I know you'd confess that. I know the kind of people you are. But I want you to hear this story in this way. That before we actually start talking about our own stories, that we hear this one. And we hear, we hear Stephen's call to remember, you're just like your ancestors. Why do you always resist the Holy Spirit? And then he goes on and he says, verse 52, was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You have received the law that was given through the angels, but you have not obeyed it. 
And when the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious. And they gnashed their teeth. But Stephen, he was full of the Holy Spirit. And he looked up to heaven and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven opening up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Now, I think what we need to hear in this story is that at the end, there are, kind, there are two options that Luke gives us. One is the response of the Sanhedrin. So it says that they, they gnashed their teeth and they were enraged about what was said. In fact, one way you could translate this is that they were, they were ripped right through the heart. In other words, how I take this is that they're saying, wait a minute. What are we going to do about this? Which is always a question that the church has. How are we going to handle this? That's their response. And the opposite response of that is Stephen. He says he was filled with God's spirit. And he had a vision of God. He looks up and he has this vision of God. You know, since we've moved into our new church building, this question has come up. And I think it's a really good question, but the, the natural question of, for our church is, how are we going to grow? We're in this new place. We have this opportunity. How are we going to grow? What's our vision for growth? And I think that's a really, really good question. I think we should ask that question. But you know the question I think that is even more important, that probably is primary, is not how do we grow, but here's the question we should really be asking, is that what kind of people are we becoming In other words, what kind of people are we inviting others to join into? Let me take you back to what was read earlier. The beginning, the end of chapter 6, it talks about how they were doing ministry and there was people that weren't being served. So the apostles who were preaching and teaching, they said, hey, let's call everybody together and I want you to choose seven people who are filled with the Holy Spirit to do this work. And so it says that they chose seven and the very first one, the very first one they chose is Stephen. So the proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. And then they chose others. And they presented these to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands over them. And then, then it says this in verse 7. So the word of the Lord spread, and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. Did you notice the movement in that text? The question wasn't so much how are we going to grow, but the question really is what kind of people are we going to be? And they say choose seven people who are filled with the Holy Spirit to do this work so that we could be about proclaiming the good news. And it says the word of the God, Lord was proclaimed. And the disciples were increased dramatically. I think we should ask the question, how are we going to grow? But I think the more fundamental question is what kind of people are we being shaped into that when we invite people to come and join us, what kind of, what, what are we inviting them into? Second response of the Sanhedrin is this. This is chapter 7, verse 57, the first part. He says, at this they covered their ears and they yelled at the top of their voices. It makes me think, I'm not holding this mic, I would do it, but you know how, when, yeah, exactly, you know when somebody talks about a movie that you haven't seen 
and you don't want to get that spoiler, you put your hands in your ears like la, 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 la. That's what I picture. Like, I don't want to hear this. I don't want to hear this. Cover my ears. Here's my guess, though. When we're talking about our response to the Holy Spirit, my everything in me says that none of you have that response. La, 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 la. At least overtly. None of us probably have that response. But here's the response that may be more dangerous. It's maybe that you're just going about your life and just as a bystander, you're not doing la, 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 la. But there are so many other voices that you don't even just realize that you can't hear. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not that we're doing this. I mean, although we might sometimes. I'm sure we've looked in our life and went, yeah, I was plugging my ears and being ridiculous. But there's probably other times in my life I'm just walking around trying to live my life, trying to do what I think is best, I think is best, and I'm just not really paying attention. Last week in our, actually two weeks ago in our small group, we were talking about this, how we hear the Holy Spirit, and Holly Osborne, she, she shared with us that for the past year, she's been praying specifically that God will give her ears and a heart to hear his spirit and hear his leading. And I was like, wow, I haven't prayed that. But she said, no, wait, here's, here's the thing. It's really hard. Like she didn't say it in a way that was like, oh yeah, I just hear God's spirit all the time. She's been, she said she's been praying and struggling and what she said was, is sometimes I'm thinking, yeah, this is what the Holy Spirit's telling me, only to realize, nope, that wasn't it. I mean, we just be honest. Like, it's hard enough when you're trying to listen. Imagine when you're not paying attention at all. And so instead of a posture that has our ears covered or is just kind of gazing around, there's this phrase that's been going around it talks about leaning in, leaning into God and the Spirit. And when you lean in, you kind of feel off balance and out of kilter. And sometimes you feel like you're going to fall on your face. But I think like Holly, she says, I've just got to lean in. And sometimes I don't hear it right. But it takes courage and humility just to walk slowly and keep leaning in and trusting that I can hear Spirit. It says, finally, the end of 57. It says, they all rushed at Stephen. And they dragged him out of the city. And they began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. The Sanhedrin and the teacher of the law... Their posture and response is to rush, to drag out, to stone, and to approve. It says Saul, or Saul was sitting there approving. But then I want you to hear the opposite of what's to the Sanhedrin, what Stephen does. While they were dragging him out, while they were stoning him, while well, there were witnesses approving, including Saul, it says, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and he cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. One of the things that I think we're tempted to do is that if we can hear God's spirit, and we feel like we know the Spirit of God, it's really tempting to be annoyed with those that we think don't hear it. If we think we're the ones that have come to some great conclusion about what God is doing in the world, 
I've done this a lot. And to just be frustrated and furious and really upset that you don't get it. But a person that's full of the Spirit, like Stephen, when others are dragging them out and stoning them, Stephen says, God, I know they don't get it. I know they can't hear your spirit. But don't hold that against them. I think Carson was right. When I asked Carson, Carson, do you have a story? And Carson went, Well, yeah, I know I have a story. I know that's the answer I'm supposed to tell you. But to tell you the truth, I don't want to tell you that I have a story because I'm afraid you're going to make me tell it. And I don't know what it is. We may be afraid to tell it because down deep we might know what it is. But here's the good news is that God has a story for you, for us, that he's already written, and he is speaking that story into your life by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he wants you, and in the book of Acts, it's clear that he wants the church to go out and tell this story. But he says, before we get to telling your story, the first thing you got to do is listen to God's spirit. And I'm not up here telling you that's an easy thing to do. It's God's story. Stephen told God's story. Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, God's story, when you listen to the Spirit, it doesn't always end up where you think it should. Because when Stephen tells this story and says, you're exactly like your ancestors, they prove him right. And Stephen becomes the first martyr of the church. Not, probably not what he was hoping for when he listened to God's Spirit and followed. God has a story, and he's telling you through the Holy Spirit. The question today, if we're going to be the Spirit-powered church, the very first task, the task that we do all the time, day and night, evening and morning, when we get up and when we lie down, when we're in that meeting or when we're at school, wherever we're in, we have to lean with the risk of falling and listen for God's Spirit. We have the courage and the humility to do that today. Come and listen as we stand and sing.
God is calling us today to be his spirit-powered church. Not to rely on the question, what will we do? What will be our vision? Not to plug our, not to plug our, God, I know they don't know what they're doing. But forgive them. And be patient. Because Saul was standing there. He wasn't listening either. And we're going to see what God does with Saul. So go this week. I charge you to go and lean into God's spirit and listen with your ears, with your eyes, listen with your bodies, listen with your whole hearts and take courage that if you're not sure what God is saying, just keep listening. Do not resist the Holy Spirit. Because God has a story for you. And if we listen, you'll hear it. Go in peace. Come oh. on.